great. Yeah. There you go. We got it. Also, uh, could hear that. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, TASI seminar with guest Ivan Fliss, um, whom I have the pleasure of introducing today. My name is Valeria Graziano. I'm also based here at SAS, and um, we're gonna hear today a lecture uh, dedicated to the topic of outline for the study of Nikola Tesla as a me. Um, and Dr. Fliss is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Cultural Studies at the University of Rijeka. He's uh, studying the memory and legacy of Nikola Tesla as part of the project Revenant, Revivals of Empire, Nostalgia, Amnesia, and Tribulation. The Remnant perspective, mixing memory studies and history and philosophy of science, constitutes Tesla, Tesla as a doubly post-empire historical person, considering he was born and educated in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and achieved most of his celebrated scientific successes in the United States. Um, even please, also, I would like to mention holds a PhD in history and philosophy of science from Utrecht University and an MA and a BA degree in psychology from the University of Zagreb. He was a visiting research fellow at the Center di Storia della Ciencia, Autonomous University of Barcelona, at the Muir Institute uh, in Galway, and also here at SASI a few years back. So uh, it's my pleasure to host Dr. Fliss and I'll, I'll leave it to you uh, to start, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is actually my first public lecture on the topic of the new research um, that I'm doing in Revenant. And I feel uh, very, um, very happy about it being at, at SAS actually it feels like coming home SAS was my first home in Croatian academia coming back from uh, Utrecht and it was crucial um, in setting me up um, and uh, introducing me to back home so to say so I'm happy to be here again um, I hope you can see the presentation now it should be visible yeah okay so um I will talk about uh, Nikola Tesla um, as a myth in a way, uh, or as a collection or as a, a number of myths and stories that have collected through the years about him um, and that were produced by various communities who either wanted to celebrate him, commemorate him, but very often claim him uh, for various uh, purposes and functions that those communities either politically or culturally or in any other way recognized uh, at the time, um, 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 at the time. So how I'm trying to think about Nikola Tesla is about him being a type of a cultural hero in a way. Um, and what does it mean for somebody to be a culture hero? This is a term that I've um, taken from Watch Horse's study of uh, Thomas Alva Edison which is actually really, really um, uh, opportune in a way, considering that we can say that in American culture, especially uh, Edison is a cult-like figure of historical and cultural significance. Um, and Wachhorst in his uh, really great book from the eighties um, studies him as a mythical figure. So as a mythical figure that uh, serves the function of um, resolving mechanically contradictory cultural values into a single paradoxical reality. So this idea that in this person and in the features of this person and these apocryphal stories and stories from their life and experiences and journey through life in a way, many of the anxieties of society at large are projected on this person and in a way resolved through the story or never resolved. And that's okay because they're a mythical uh, uh, person so they can sustain the paradox in a way. And this is the way that I would like to think about Tesla um, as, a, as a type of a, a, a cultural hero who uh, marries contradictory cultural values 
into a single paradoxical reality. It's a bit more complicated with Tesla than Edison, considering that Edison is, okay, through America being the reference culture of the 20th and 21st century for globally for all countries and societies, that means that Edison is famous or a cultural person globally, but um, uh, mythologically how Watchhurst lo looks at him is that he his um, figure resolves the issues of American society primarily. For Tesla, that is definitely not the case, considering um, a number of imagined communities, a number of ethnic communities and national communities actually have a stake in the claim to this mythological figure and actually project various cultural va uh, values producing a number of paradoxical realities. So this myth is much more complicated than just serving um, uh, a single national community and then being exported globally. This one is being developed at the same time in different communities in parallel and they are influencing each other. So you can already see that this is a mess to study in a way. How do you encompass this amount of cultural production about a person like this. I just included some pictures here in the background for you to entertain yourself visually while I'm talking about the introduction to the lecture. We can see um, uh, an Indian postal stamp with Nikola Tesla here. Um, uh, this is, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, yeah. Um, then you can see uh, the plaque in front of the hotel room in New York that he died in. Um, and right below it is the Nikola Tesla corner where in New York he fed pigeons, for example. Above that, you have the Mestrovich st statue in Zagreb. On the right, uh, a really B-production Hollywood movie about Nikola Tesla. On the left, a Lovecraft Tesla comic uh, or a comic Tesla on Mars uh, and etc. cetera. Um, or in the left bottom corner, I think for all of us are familiar, we are familiar with this um, uh, a recent resurgence of kind, of kind of Tesla commemoration and these paradoxical issues, Tesla on the creation Euro coin, um, which, which produced, um, which produced um, uh, conflicts in public um, and different readings of what does it mean. This is just a selection. Oh, my favorite one here is Nikola Tesla provides free Wi-Fi to Silicon Valley. This is a statue in the Silicon Valley where they put in a Wi-Fi router. So he's produ uh, uh, producing internet, right? So this is a commemoration of Tesla uh, and his work on, on wireless energy transmission and wireless um, uh, information transmission in general. So we see there are very many uh, commemorations and very, uh, very many cultural values projected through time into this person uh, and into this figure. Uh, what is the structure? How am I going to outline this and how am I going to propose how to study this and give some examples? Um, before the myth, I'm going to talk about the man a bit. So we're on the same page who he was and like what is his like very basic biography. Um, I'm going to introduce this very briefly, this idea of how do we think about him spatially in a way of him moving through actual space, countries, continents, cities, uh, communities, and how this movement actually produced the very many associations that would then later be appropriated into these mythological or mythical structures. Um, then I'm going to go into uh, a detailed analysis of what would it mean to study Tesla is a myth, and how do I propose uh, to approach this also empirically, methodologically, but analytically too. What is the analytical framework for looking at Tesla as a myth and what are kind of the, the authors or the inspirations that we can take for, for this study? Uh, I'm gonna sum it up in two ways with critical themes from everything that I talked about before. So to extract some of the general topics uh, for our discussion, and also with a brief note at the end uh, on history, memory, and the past, and how we can take uh, heed from this study of Tesla uh, for study of memory and study of history and historical, um, historical knowledge in general um, uh, for other purposes too. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so let's go to the man before the myth. So Tesla was born in 1856 in Smilan in Lika, what was then the Austro-Hungarian military frontier. Uh, Lika is, as we know today in, in Croatia, 
Um, but um, Tesla was the son of an Orthodox Serbian priest um, and his family actually both on his mother's side um, uh, and on his father's side were priests and officers and soldiers, um, both in the Austro-Hungarian army, but also uh, uh, in um, his grandfather served with Napoleon, for example, because uh, Napoleon conquered the Illyrian provinces, as he called them, uh, during, during his grandfather's life. Anyways, so this is where Tesla was born. He was born in Smiljan. Soon his family, uh, shortly after the death of his older brother, it, he died in an accident. They moved to Gospić, where he attended school, um, and then went to um, a gymnasium in how they call it Gorni Karlovci, or how the Austrians call it Karlstadt or Karlovac, what we call today. Um, he left Karlovac for Graz, where he attended the Joanneum Polytechnic in Graz in, uh, from 75 to 77. So this was a polytechnic school founded um, by um, the Austro-Hungarian government. So it was an imperial school for training civil engineers, which was a great need um, in the empire at the time. It wasn't teaching electrical engineering, although there was a number of teachers that Tesla identified as uh, crucial inspirations for kind of opening the world of electricity for him there. He even named some of the professors, but he was trained as a civil engineer. So uh, the kind of an engineer that builds buildings and roads and aqueducts and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he shifted completely from this, even at this early age. Um, so he, this period after Graz is some, some a bit shady or a bit uh, unclear what has happened. Um, he lost his scholarship. He also spent half a year or even more in Maribor, working this dead end job and drinking a lot and uh, gambling and uh, completely losing contact with his family. They even reported uh, ask his friends or uh, send the police to look for him because he didn't uh, come back or send any letters or anything back home. But, uh, and he also got very sick at the end of this period. And after uh, getting better, he first left for, for Prague, for Prague University, where he planned to attend uh, the university. He did attend less lectures, but he never formally enrolled at the university, and he spent less than a year there, um, soon leaving for Budapest in 18, um, 1881 where he found a job as a junior engineer um, in installing the Budapest Telephone Exchange. And it was the first telephone exchange in Budapest. I'm not sure, maybe even in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but don't, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's true. Um, and there he worked particularly with Ferenc Puskas, but also his brother Tivadar. And I don't know if you're never familiar with Tivadar Puskas, but he's a really important kind of this... Uh, 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 person of this age who lived in the United States for a while. He worked with Bell on, on his telephone invention for a while. He also was a close confidant and friend of Edison. Uh, so Tivadar Puskas was really like this central person in this milieu of um, electricians, uh, uh, telegraph engineers, and uh, uh, businessmen who opened this kind of whole line of business in Europe, uh, and especially in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Tesla was a very talented engineer. He was trained at the Joanneum, and he distinguished himself. And Tivadar uh, sent him with a letter to Paris, actually, to where one of Edison's uh, European companies was um, uh, was working. Uh, Edison had a number of European companies in Germany, in France. I'm not sure about the UK, but maybe even the UK, because he needed a way to monetize his patents across the pond, right? So this was the way, a way for him to sell uh, his technologies for uh, direct current generation of electricity and also for arc lightning. So these light, uh, lighting, uh, electricity lighting that was uh, all the rage uh, at the time. So um, Tesla ended in the, uh, from 82 to 83 in Paris and then in Strasbourg working for this uh, company of Edison's, uh, the European company of Edison's. And of course he distinguished himself too there uh, with his kind of inventive mind. And supposedly according to his autobiography, he was already then thinking about the polyphase system and trying to design it in a way. And he was talking to people there about it. This is very, a, a strange age, like we now uh, look at Tesla as the inventor of the alternating current system and the kind of electricity age that we live in today. But at the time, it was a very different world. The dominant system and the dominant technology um, 
in the US and largely in Europe were direct current generators. Uh, and they had a huge problem is uh, that was long, long distance transmission. So you didn't have transformers for changing a voltage and et cetera to uh, tra transfer electricity at long distances. So these generators were actually in houses in, um, in city centers, right? Uh, and they were used as kind of these, these uh, luxurious producers of electricity for shop fronts lighting or for uh, rich people's and uh, rich people homes and et cetera. So it wasn't this ubiquitous electricity that we live with today. Anyways, um, Tesla distinguished himself there too and worked closely with Batchelor, who is one of the closest uh, uh, confidants of Edison. Uh, he's, he's an American and Edison sent him to Paris to kind of oversee his business empire there, right? And Batchelor soon realized that it would be good to snatch up this young engineer and send him to Menlo Park, to Edison in, in the United States. And indeed he did that. And in 84, um, Tesla moves to New York as a really poor and destitute engineer with really big plans and, and grand designs, but not with a big name or distinguishing himself uh, other than in these particular engineering communities. So he moves to New York and works very briefly with Edison. They've had a falling out, supposedly because of money. This is also clouded in mystery. Sources are very sparse on this. Supposedly because of money, there were also big characters, big personalities. Edison at the peak or already at the end of his career. Um, Tesla as a, a young engineer, as a, as a hungry engineer. So there was supposedly also some personality incompatibility, let's put it like that. And uh, they had a falling out and Tesla struggled for quite a while and it took him a couple of years to find the connections in um, the engineering and business uh, circles of New York uh, to actually start a number of companies of him, his and to work on patents that would be recognized that applied for. And keep in mind at the time, this is a very, very different world than we recognize today again, not only because of how electricity worked, but also because how institutions worked, right? Uh, funding structures did not exist. So there were no government funding agencies. There was no uh, university. University laboratories were sparse and far in between. Uh, the uh, German research university still hasn't properly arrived in the United States. So American universities were something very different than for, from what we know today. Also, industrial laboratories did not exist. They started, uh, first industrial laboratories started in the early 20th century. Uh, Edison had Menlo Park as his laboratory, but that was a very different beast than, than a proper industrial laboratory. So it was very hard to find money, uh, but there was a budding, um, budding community of inventors, especially in, uh, in uh, New York and a community of businessmen who looked at ways to actually monetize these inventions and kind of be ahead, ahead of the pack. Uh, Tesla uh, fell in with a really good patent lawyer and that was actually a crucial moment, this first connection. This patent lawyer, lawyer later died and some historians actually say that Tesla's star fell when he, he stopped working with a really good patent lawyer who was kind of protecting his interests. But the most crucial connection that's kind of talked about is with Westinghouse. And Westinghouse was running one of the big electricity uh, lightning and uh, production companies of the time, right? And um, then he uh, applied for his patent for the polyphase system and for the induction motor. And this is what Tesla is most known for, both in historical circle, circles and publicly. This is where his fame comes from, from these number of patents that he um, applied for then. Uh, and they are kind of crucial for the development of um, um, of um, uh, DC power, right, and power systems. Um, so um, he became rich, right? He earned a lot of money out of it. He lived in hotel rooms for most of his life in New York. He had laboratories in Manhattan in the city center, never had a flat or an apartment, lived in these exclusive hotels. Uh, he uh, ate at really fancy restaurants, uh, spent time in high society, not only with the financiers where he was getting the money for his research and the context that he needed, but also with the kind of cultural elite, with the journalists, with Mark Twain, for example, with like this uh, uh, New York, high society uh, at the end of the century. Um, so 
uh, on, on the wings of this fame in 92, he came back to Europe. He lectured at the Royal Society in London. This was quite spectacular and really noted, but also for the first time after leaving, visited Gospic with Zagreb and uh, visited Belgrade for the only time in his life. Um, and um, this European trip is, is uh, relatively important for the speciality of Tesla. Okay, uh, he came back and one of the other crucial moments in his life is participating in the Chicago World Fair. So World Fairs were these big technological um, fairs, basically. So these moments where inventors and businessmen and the publics came together and imagined technological futures, right? And this was really big for Tesla and Westinghouse because Westinghouse got the contract to actually produce um, or designed a system to light the whole fair. So the electric, electric lighting for the whole fair was produced by Westinghouse based on Tesla's patents, but also they had an exhibition where Tesla uh, exhibited a number of his inventions in a really spectacular way. So he was a very flamboyant presenter, right? He invented this thing um, before, years before he invented this thing called the Columbus egg, which is like an egg that rotated itself in a magnetic field. If you've never seen it, you can see it in Smilan or in Belgrade in, in Tesla's museum. It's pretty fascinating and it's a way to kind of showcase what an induction motor is to um, non-engineering publics, right? So this is a huge success. This was, this was part of his celebrity, right? So he was a celebrity at the time. Um, and uh, three years later, Niagara Falls opened the power plant. This was one of the first big power plants that could also transmit power at long distances. Tesla's involvement wasn't in actually designing the plant, but a lot of what was designed in the plant was actually based on his patents. And it kind of fed into his myth, like the imaginarium of Tesla designing the, the Niagara Falls power plant. And he fed it himself too. So he told all these stories how as a kid, he imagined that he would create power plants on the Niagara Falls and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. This, we're coming to the end of his really productive uh, celebratory period, let's put it like that, because he had a lot of money, he had really central st status, he was really connected in New York, both on, on the business side and on the um, academic side and on the invention side, so he was really a central figure of this world in a way, connecting uh, many, many sides, and he started experimenting with high-frequency generators, so his new obsession was long-distance transmission without any wires, so wireless transmission of power, of energy. He also started thinking about uh, the transmission of information, of sound, so this is the um, this is the source of the later uh, Marconi conflicts over the invention of the radio, right? Uh, that's also relatively famous that Marconi and Tesla were in a dispute who invented the radio. Uh, and this was a dispute that was very much legal in the United States. It, it went in courts, right? Because the patents were owned both on the Marconi side and on Tesla side by central big companies that could earn a lot of money out of it. So this was not only a priority claim for the fame, but also a lot of money was involved in that. Tesla did his experiments not in New York because he needed really large generators and he discharged a lot of power into the air and into the ground, which is, uh, which is dangerous in, in big cities. And also there's this kind of romantic moment where he had to leave the city to a smaller place to kind of think and see a new direction for his research and for his inventions. He first left for Colorado Springs. Then when he got funding, especially from JP Morgan, he got massive amounts of money, millions of dollars in today's currency to build uh, a big laboratory and a big uh, tower in Long Island, uh, what was called Wardenclyffe, the, uh, the place, um, to continue these, this research. But the research was spectacular. He made spectacular proclamations that he contacted Martians, that, uh, that he would transmit uh, radio signals from Colorado Spring to Paris directly, uh, that he he would transfer power from Niagara Falls across the world so that he could power devices without any uh, connection between them anywhere in the world. But he actually never delivered on any of those proclamations. So he fed the celebrity, but didn't actually come with the patents that could actually do what he was selling. He lost funding. He also started exp experiencing a lot of mental health issues or mental break breakdowns, as he called them. And soon after he had to close the laboratories as the funding dried out um, and his kind of career 
took a downturn. So he still invented, he still submitted patents, he moved from electrical engineering a bit, but the next 40 or so, 30, 35 years were really less productive and turning Tesla turned from like a productive inventor central to all these communities into this kind of a techno scientific philosopher or even a futurist talking about how the world could look like if uh, technology was adapted, invented, et cetera. He died in New York in 43, 80, at the age of 86. And, um, and, um, uh, his nachlas, so his legacy, his papers and everything that he had left was moved in 51 from New York to Belgrade where the Nikola Tesla Museum was founded. Actually, it was moved by way of Rijeka. So it went from uh, New York to Rijeka by ship. The ship was called Serbia and then by train to Belgrade. And a couple of years later, this legacy, these papers and all the collections, everything that was found in his room after he died uh, was the core of the archive that would be at the center of the Nikola Tesla uh, Museum in Bel Belgrade. His ashes followed soon after. So his ashes are also uh, in Belgrade. Okay, I took a lot of time with this, but I think it's good that we have this kind of, that we're on the same page who this person was um, in a way. So if we think about all the story that I told you spa spatially through time, I'm actually not gonna show the map because I don't want to waste time. I took a bit more uh, with this. If we think, about Tesla spatially through time, we see him moving from Smilan to Gospic, to Karlovac, to Graz, to Maribor, uh, to Prague, to Budapest, to Paris, Strasbourg, New York, Colorado Springs, Long Island. So there's this trajectory of Tesla through space and time where he kind of produced very many associations and very moment, very many moments or places or situations, episodes that later as his myth grew uh, were commemorated and were built into large, larger than life stories. Um, that's the case, for example, with his visit to Zagreb and to Belgrade on this trip back or his lecture at the Royal Society in London. Um, so even like brief moments that he lived somewhere or that he did something were kind of taken up and turned into um, uh, mythological proportions. Another word that we can use to think about myths spatially is monomyth, right? So this is a Campbellian uh, Joseph Campbell term inspired by Jung um, and his ideas of collective unconscious and mythology. And the monomyth is a hero's journey, right? So it's an actual journey from moving through places. And this monomyth, I wouldn't use it too, um, too uh, strongly as an analytical framework, but it's a good inspiration to think about. Uh, what does it mean to study a sprawling myth of Tesla? So we can approach this in two ways. What I did now in, in giving you an outline of the man, man, I was much closer to this idea of a historicist biography or a reception study, let's put it like that. And such a study asks questions like, how was Tesla's work and image received and circulated by the imagined communities that claim him? So both imagined communities in the ethnic sense, in the Andersonian sense, so by the Americans, Serbs, Croats, Slovenians, Yugoslavs, etc., but also in a much uh, broader way by the communities of engineers, of inventors, of um, engineering teachers, of very professional communities that kind of lay claim to his genius for different purposes. And in that, uh, we can make him very passive, right? The Tesla did all these things, but then people appropriated his life and his work and his legacy and actually used it for their purposes. This is not the way that I think the story should be told because he had much agency in this production of myth during his life. He was a really, really savvy guy and he really uh, crafted a particular public persona for particular purposes. Um, I I'm gonna talk about that a bit later, but he definitely had agency during his life in the kind of images that were produced about him. We can take a completely different tack. And that's something that I'm gonna talk much more in this lecture. And I call it an anti-historicist description of Tesla. So it's looking at an agglutinated, this, this mashup, this weird bricolage, this, this thing that has parts that stuck together, but they don't really function properly with each other. It's an inconsistent memory and legacy, right? 
Um, so we're looking at how do Tesla's multiple legacies overlap, erase, and modify each other through a century of commemoration or, and forgetting. So all these communities and, and he, he himself had different purposes in commemorating and remembering him. And when they overlap, they or forget in an organized way or ignore in an organized way and they inform each other. So they're not completely separate, but it's a soup more than like a straight parallel lines going through time, right? So these are completely opposite ways, but I think they can inform each other and they can make, if taken properly, they can make for a really fascinating study of uh, Tesla as a cultural hero. How would, it, how would it look like? So I've taken a quotation here from uh, Thomas Hughes's, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm good. I've taken a quotation here from Thomas Hughes's um, book, uh, The Networks of Power Electrification in Western Society from 1880 to 1930. Hughes is one of the preeminent historians of technology and this book is kind of one of the classics uh, that kind of narrates or describes how was Western society electrified and Hughes studies the United States, Germany and France primarily. And Tesla has a very brief, brief appearance in this book. Um, some would say too brief, uh, but Hughes explains how he included Tesla and also why he thinks that maybe Tesla is too widely acclaimed for her, the historical role that he played in this development. So what does Hughes say? He says, the most widely acclaimed of the inventors of the alternating current motor was Nikola Tesla. Tesla is better known than the others, not only because of the success of his invention, but, but, also, but also because of his native country, Yugoslavia, uh, this was originally published in the 80s, um, uh, has rigorously cultivated his memory. Because he was associated with a leading American manufacturer, Westinghouse, because he was greatly honored by his contemporaries, and because he was a colorful, dramatic personality who attracted considerable attention in newspapers and periodicals, and about whom a number of books for the general audience have been written. So let's unpack this Hughes's view of Tesla's acclaimed status. So what does he actually say? The first reason that he gives for Tesla's possibly outsized role in the history of the war of the currents, as it's called this DC-AC conflict between Edison and Tesla, as it's often narrated, is his rigorous cultivation of his memory by Yugoslav historians. And this is a really, we can interpret this in different ways. Uh, Hughes is a very sophisticated and very careful historian. So he uses um, uh, what he calls Yugoslav sources and he engages with this literature, but he also has the impression that there is kind of a nationalistic bias in this historians trying to commemorate Tesla and push him into the center of the narrative, which is very interesting considering that what's implied here that there is no American bias in this, right? Which leads us to the second thing. The second reason that he gives is an association with a crucial American manufacturer, which is Westinghouse and the recognition by, recognition by his peers. So this is a very, American side of the story. So because Tesla was at the center of what would become the techno-scientific empire of the United States in the 20th and 21st century, he was also remembered and he's also a crucial actor because of his association with the metropole uh, in a way here. The third reason is his personality. He was dramatic, he was eccentric, he seeked cele uh, celebrity and he built his status, right? And um, okay, so if we look at these three reasons, what do we see in them? In the first one, we see how Tesla in academic history also, not only in popular work, is a post-Hungarian who is ethicized by number of communities, by Yugoslavs, by Serbs, by Croats, but also by Americans, right? As an American Serb or an American Yugoslav as they often call him, and as an American inventor. So this ethicization of Tesla is really multi-layered and projected from different communities for different purposes in different times. When we include immigrant communities here, like for example, uh, American Yugoslav, American Serbs, American Croats, American Slovenians, it, the story becomes even more complicated because they found a use for legitimizing themselves to the majority in the United States. The second one that we can see here in, in Hughes's uh, analysis is the inertia of a hidden empire of the US, uh, USA. I use hidden empire following um, uh, the historian Immerwar who talks about the US as an empire that never admitted being one, right? So we can see this hidden empire inertia writing techno-scientific history in general. So this Hughes also has 
a bias of a certain kind. If it's not American, then it's definitely European. And okay, we can get into an ar the argument, why is New York, for example, or Berlin or London, the center in all histories of ele electrical engineering, whether that's because it happened there or because it's the historians who are biased, it's a little bit of both probably, but we can see that um, any other kind of kind of national push for for claiming him in this way is seen as bias, while uh, the uh, central position of the USA is just seen as good academic practice, right? So this is much more complicated than I put it now. And Hughes is a much more sophisticated historian, but this is something to unpack, right? Um, and the third is his inventor self. So this. Uh, celebrity, celebrity status that Tesla himself built. And I call it the inventor self uh, shadowing the concept for history of science called scholar, scholarly self. So this public persona of a certain profession and Tesla self-identified as an inventor primarily. And he fashioned a persona that really functioned well in the society he lived in and was useful for him and was also enjoyable. I bet that he enjoyed it, this, this kind of status of one of the uh, wizards of electricity, right? How they called him. Um, okay, so if we take these elements for Tesla's monomyth, um, we have three parts, right? Post-empire ethicization, post-empire in two senses. Post-empire in the sense of uh, the American empire that doesn't actually exist and also the post-empire of Austro-Hungaria that is no more, right? So it's literally a post-empire. We have the element in the US's rise and as an imperial techno-scientific culture. So, right, see, he is a crucial figure in this techno-science that, uh, especially after World War II, is the dominant culture in science and in general in popular culture that is exported around the world and also that his earliest image and that his image during his li life is actually self-crafted so that it's a persona that he had a use for he financed his research through this persona he had status through this persona in the nascent american celebrity culture um so he really used journalists and also uh, the rising tabloids that were uh, coming into being in this time and this status of a member of new york high society to really project himself as the preeminent inventor of his age in the United States for a brief period of time. Some would argue even displacing Edison. This is a topic for another time. What are the many faces of the hero here, of the myth? For the post-empire artization, there are very many. Tesla the Yugoslav, Tesla the Serb, Tesla the Croat, Tesla the immigrant, the one who left. Tesla the Christian, the son of an Orthodox priest who kind of uh, had constant con uh, associations. He was buried in, a, in an Orthodox rite with six priests serving there. Uh, so there is, there is a really strong connection there. Tesla the Forgotten. So this moment of self-victimization for certain ethnic communities here where he is claimed to be forgotten and his legacy needs to be cherished because the Americans, the other communities, the powers that be will left him, leave him to the sideline of the history and we need to commemorate him. Other faces coming from the, from the side of the imperial techno-scientific culture of the US, US of the 20th century is definitely Tesla the American, but also Tesla the scientist, Tesla the immigrant, the one who participated in the American dream and built a new society and a new world there because he came there, and Tesla the New Yorker. So this um, strange, eccentric member of the soirees and the salons of the uh, New York high society. Um, the last one coming from um, what, what he himself crafted and how he curated his own image that lived on in the monomyth uh, long after he had died is him as an inventor, of course, this was his prim primary focus, but also Tesla the genius, the eccentric genius who thought up all this in his mind and had a really lively internal life. Tesla, the humanitarian, the anti-war Tesla, who had this techno optimism that if proper technology was invented, nation states would stop waging wars, which of course never happened. Tesla, the eccentric, the strange old man feeding pigeons, uh, never marrying, having these 
it's odd for his time opinions about women and relationships with women, but also living in a hotel room for his whole life. So he's he's a really eccentric figure at the time when he lived, and especially so later on. So all these faces of the hero, as I put it, kind of uh, feature in the monomyth. It kind of agglutinates into a mass that kind of overlaps, but also forgets uh, mutually. Okay, um, I don't have much time, so I'm going to go uh, more quickly through this. This is some just some example for, for each of these features that I identified of the kind of case studies that I'm planning to do within this framework. So studying his 80th birthday jubilee that was celebrated in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia and both in the US in 36. So uh, Sava Kosanovic organizing the move of his Nachlas from New York to Belgrade, resulting in the fund funding of the Belgrade Nikola Tesla Museum, but also the subsequent Tesla centennial ce celebrations in communist Yugoslavia and the US, which is also an interesting parallel, both the Americans and the Yugoslav communists investing organized state effort into celebrate, especially the Yugoslavs investing organized state effort into celebrate him. Uh, much more recently, the year of Tesla, as it was declared in 2006, and the Memorial Center Nikola Tesla that was uh, opened in Smiljan, in cooperation between Croatia, Croatia and Serbia, the governments, which is a very different story from what happened 15 years later, right? When the Croatia Euro coin featuring Tesla's face uh, is a topic. And this is the very opposite kind of government reactions are really a product of the geopolitical time, right? The EU, uh, uh, EU ascendancy and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's really topical in a way that Tesla is instrumentalized by politicians at this time. An element in the American dominant techno science, the Colombian exhibition that I mentioned in 94, one of his most famous and most important um, uh, biographies was published by a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, John O'Neill, who's also a friend of his. And many of the stories that feature in the myth are actually sourced in this biography, which should be studied as a, both as a source as, and as a template for many of the myths that fed into different communities. And uh, a really scientific topic that I would love to study and include, especially in this part, is how come uh, the 11th General Conference on Weights and Measures named the SI unit for magnetic induction the Tesla in 1960? So this was a, a, this was a product of certain political and expert maneuvering and negotiation that Tesla was awarded this huge honor, right? In the 60s, where some argue that he was already largely forgotten, some would say. So how did this come to be that in Paris, this collection of experts and politicians decided to name um, the um, unit of magnetic, ma magnetic indu induction Tesla? Crafting the inventor self, um, it's, during his productive years in New York, he meticulously nurtured the public persona, as I said. He had a press clipping collection that uh, we have in the museum of Nikola Tesla now. So he uh, collected all the newspaper reports about himself. So he was really like a uh, his own kind of agent in a way, building a uh, celebrity, right? Uh, because that was very useful for him. And as I said, I think he also must have enjoyed it. Um, and also his only autobiography, which was published as a six part um, article in the Electrical Experimenter magazine that was aimed to be didactic. So the editor ordered it as, I want to instruct the American youth in how to follow the inventor's path and who better to do it than Nikola Tesla, the preeminent inventor of the US, right? So it's really, really didactic and it's really him explaining his life path to this audience. And this is another source of many of the topics that are built in different myths by different communities. Okay, um, so critical themes that gather through here. There's particularizing themes, especially in the ethnicization parts. Tesla is a national hero for Americans, Yugoslav, Croats, Serbians, but also a completely opposite paradoxical force that universalizes. So Tesla is a universal techno-scientific hero as the inventor of the electrical age that we all live in nowadays, right? And this all is mixed up into a doubly post-empire Tesla, as I insinuated before. One that goes through the erasure of the liminal Tesla from the military frontier, this Serb in Austro-Hungaria um, 
in the military frontier from a priestly and from a soldier family who left the empire to pursue his dreams and his career. And the second post-empire Tesla, uh, which, who is reconstituted in the American Edison-like cult of the eccentric genius as a te techno-scientific cultural export. So he's exported as the American genius, right? So it's, it's again, movement. Um, okay. I drew out some notes on history, memory, and the past of how to do this and how to think about it, but I'm gonna shorten it a bit because I think I included a lot already. I'm just gonna leave you with one final quotation. This is something I'm working on currently. I'm going through his correspondences with his family in Lika. Um, and I started reading this book about his father. This is the only book about uh, Tesla's father that I could find uh, written by uh, Milutin Matic uh, Milovan Matic, sorry. Um, and this is what I found in it. And it's, it was really, as I was preparing for this lecture, I was like, okay, there is something to this mythological analysis of looking at Tesla as a myth. This is how Matic uh, narrates or describes Tesla's birth. So there is a comet a year before Tesla was born above Smilan. And I, actually Milutin Tesla, his father wrote in the uh, send a text to the newspapers in Novi Sad reporting this comment a year before Tesla was born. And this is how Matic interprets this. It is appropriate to say that Nikola Tesla's birth was after all announced a year earlier, akin to how the Bethlehem star announced the birth of Jesus Christ to the wise man, or how in similar manner, the birth of Alexander of Macedon, Kara George Petrovic and other significant personalities were foretold, right? So he is the bringer of the electrical age, and he is a kind of a mythical genius, mythical great that we need to commemorate and we need to celebrate in different ways. Thank you very much for your attention. And that's it for me on the outline of studying Nikola Tesla as a myth. Thank you, Ivan. Um, thank you all. Uh, this was an incredible um, storytelling and mapping of a very intricate um, research path. I think you have your work cut out for you in all these dimensions um, and intersecting the spatial and the temporal and all these different agencies that are at, at play with uh, the myth making. Uh, truly fascinating, thank you. I was wondering um, how to go about this uh, transition to a more discussion collegially. Uh, we usually have a fellow introducing a guest speaker, so uh, usually what I'd say at this point is for the fellow to maybe break the ice, but this is not our case today. Uh, so I wonder if anyone uh, has uh, has some maybe questions or even just simple clarifications. There was a lot of material covered to start off. Okay, I can, yeah. I can say something. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, very informative, but not just informative. It was also the way you you uh, managed to put it all together to make it uh, uh, the narrative. You know, make, you you make it uh, really exciting, especially for someone like me who is completely um, out of the, of the of the field. Now, I uh, also this is why I I don't I don't really have uh, like a, an actual um, um, a question. Is more like um, I mean uh, I would uh, it would be interesting maybe to for me at least to, to know maybe a bit more about um, the, uh, the nationalistic bias that you mentioned at some point, uh, the Yugoslav nationalistic bias that you mentioned at some point when you're talking about um, Hugh's view. I mean, obviously, um, um, if I understood you correctly, because maybe I missed some, uh, some points, but uh, I think that uh, Hughes tried right to emphasize uh, to uh, the, um, the, the nationalistic bias of uh, the young Yugoslav uh, historians. And I, I was just curious uh, if, to, to, what, to what extent uh, he was right or, or, mm -hmm. or wrong. 
<laughs> I don't know if, if, if it makes yeah. sense. Thank you very much again. Yeah, that's why I was very kind of, I hedged the way that I put it. So I, I said that I simplified it and it's a complicated thing, right? Because it is a complicated thing because he's right to an extent. So there are very many popular histories by the time that he was writing this history, right? There are very many popular histories produced in Serbia and in Croatia and in Yugoslavia that take very strange views on Tesla and that really built him into what I call the mythological persona, right? So for a, this kind of a empiricist, historicist person like Hughes, this all sounds preposterous, right? But on the other hand, you have the museum uh, where the archive is situated and you have professional historians, especially the ones in the United States that he's familiar with, right? Who do describe his crucial role in this development. So he knows that he has to take him seriously, but it's very hard to kind of marry these things. But why I took this out, because you will not see Hughes talking about Edison like this, for example, and you have a lot of crap published about Edison in English and in all languages, right? But he will have this kind of critical capacity of a historian of technology to say, I will disregard all this and I will focus on the stuff that's interesting. But he doesn't do that with Tesla, right? But with Tesla, he has, he says, there's an outsized role because the Yugoslavs have a bias, right? Uh, which I would come back with, well, couldn't we say that Edison has a role because Americans have a bias? that's com completely preposterous. So both ways, it's completely preposterous, right? Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I can give you like a hot and uh, 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 examples of crazy preposterous stuff being said, but I'm actually not comfortable with it without putting it into a context, right? Because I think it serves a purpose and taking this a uh, judgmental view of a historian of technology who says everything that's published is hagiography and crap doesn't actually acknowledge why it's produced and what kind of function does it serve and what kind of knowledge production it is. It kind of serves a certain community in a certain way, but not necessarily uh, I'm an American history professor at a research university, right? Yeah. Sorry, I had mu yeah, muted us, you. but you were. Yeah, I just, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to add. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So um, maybe I can follow through since we, I have the mic. Uh, I will abuse my privilege as moderator, but please do, uh, people, let me know uh, when you like to interject as well. Um, I have a couple of points that I wanted to raise. So. Um, they're kind of interlinked and uh, I usually meander a bit, so bear with me. But um, I think the first aspect I wanted to ask if you uh, could maybe touch upon a bit more uh, than what um, was allowed in this presentation is uh, something you mentioned towards the beginning about one of the facets of the myth being also the Tesla for the community of practice that it belongs to. So we're talking about the other engineers, I would imagine, the businessmen and the many uh, yeah. kind of roles that uh, protect patents and, and this uh, kind of budding uh, transnational word of uh, what we could call uh, the, uh, the new elites that are very important yeah. today. And in a way, so this is my interest because in a way what we're witnessing through the meteor uh, sketching in front of us is also one of the first global uh, uh, kind of celebrities belonging to this techno like Pluto. I don't even know. Um, I know Mackenzie Ward calls this the Victoria class, for example, but that term needs its own unpacking for those who are not into media yeah. studies. But what I'm trying to say is that I think it seems like a very rich perspective there uh, to bring to these uh, communities. And you just mentioned that at the beginning, I was kind of waiting to hear more, but it, I, I can understand there are uh, the incredible time constraints that are your, uh, kind of covering a big, a big process. Um, and the second, I think, relates a little bit to this. Uh, the second point is um, in the intersection of uh, spatial kind of aspects of the figuration of Tesla and the, and the temporal ones, 
did he himself in this self-crafted so from the perspective of his own agency i would be curious to hear a bit more did he uh play with these positionalities himself in other words would he play uh, himself out to be more of an american at some moments of his trajectories versus to be an emigrant slash immigrant in the various contexts where he was moving or was that something that because from from what you were saying, it seems very concerned with the journalistic, the sensationalistic, eccentric, da da da. So I wonder whether he also um, changes his own agency in intervening uh, in in presenting the persona, the Tesla self brand. Uh, thanks for the questions. They're actually great. Uh, flutter for my thought how to to think about this. Um, so um, for your first question about his kind of role in this kind of uh, technocratic elite that kind of developed during the 20th century and especially in, in the 21st century and his role that he plays in there. I think the, the most interesting case study is Tesla, the, the car, right? The company. Um, and it's it's um, this, uh, this moment when he was commemorated in the 60s when the SI unit was awarded his name, right? Um, this is something that really installed him as one of the greats, like with uh, Amper and Volta and et cetera. So Tesla is one of them, which is a very strange moment, considering that his position himself, and I'm going to actually connect uh, the answer to the two questions, his position at the end of the 19th century, he was the so-called lone invent inventor, right? At the time, you had uh, a whole ecology of inventors who basically depended, depended on patrons for the most part to fund their research, who then were involved with uh, claiming the patents, right? So they were somehow benefiting from either um, creating production lines that would sell uh, machines and, and contraptions built on those patents or, or sell the patents themselves, right? And, and get some, some kind of uh, money from that. And, um, but uh, uh, during Tesla's life, this whole social context completely disappeared and shifted, right? Because uh, already with Edison's late career, and Edison had this research center called Menlo Park, right? Um, and already with Edison, but especially with like Bell, for example, and uh, these big American manufacturers in the chemical industry, electric industry, telephony, telegraphy, etc. This was shifting from a lone inventor to a hired expert, right? And um, there's an argument to be made here. I'm still empirically not sure how to make it because I need to go into the sources and think about it a little bit more. But there is um, uh, uh, an argument to be made here that uh, for these communities of uh, paid educated experts working in companies in big organizations, Tesla becomes this kind of a Promethean figure, right? this man who was there before the laboratories and look at the work that he did, right? Look at the, the age that he has produced while we in the research laboratories, we're doing the work and we're inspired by him, but we are much more constrained in what we can do in redesigning the system, right? So I think, uh, and also the company aspect with Tesla, uh, with, with the cars, I find it very, interesting how American public imagination connects Elon Musk and Nikola Tesla. And they are actually very similar in the strangest way, uh, the need for celebrity status and the actually manipulation of the celebrity status for monetary gain, right? So they're very savvy in that, but otherwise completely different people. Right, uh, Tesla, uh, a, a poor boy from a liminal space who received a solid education but had no money for most of his life and really struggled and died in poverty versus Musk, we know who Musk is. So very, very different stories there, right? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if that answers your questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I should think about it. I think it's a really good angle. Absolutely. Thanks for, yeah, much to say, but um, perhaps I can um, uh, maybe have Nicola uh, intervene. And then there's a couple of written questions. We could mm -hmm. have those, unless there's anyone else who wants to let me know. Yeah. <clears throat> I, Hi, thank you so much for this very fascinating 
paper. I was really looking forward to hearing it. I, I missed the very first minute. So probably uh, my, if my question is, uh, has been answered in the first minute, sorry for this. But I was wondering a bit, wh where do you locate your research exactly? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's uh, because I, I come from a very background as an historian and I see, of, of, of course, a lot of like connection to the a big scholarship on the history of mi global migration. So I think mm -hmm. of the studies or research of Tara Zara, mm -hmm. uh, all the, and so of course the, the case of Tesla is one of those, I mean, can be put in this big, in this big frame of like the, history of migration from Eastern or Central Eastern Europe to the US. And so what be, would be special in this case, what, what tell us this story on regard, I mean, related to this big scholarship. I know, for example, Dominic Crail is writing right now a biography of Fiorello La Guardia, mm -hmm. the first major of New York, the Habsburg major of New York, mayor of New York also from Rijeka. So, I mean, this would be like interesting to relate the research with this scholarship because the, the, your talk was, mo was much uh, about like the biography of this guy, you know, of, of Nikola Tesla, but a bit less a bit about the demise uh, finally. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other question would be like, is it, uh, is it, is it your research about very much about the memory memory studies or memory history. And this would be for me very interesting to know how this myth has been, for example, instrumentalized during the, the, the I mean, the, the, the short 20th century, <laughs> to, to say, yeah. with all the ideological and political conflicts in, the, uh, in Europe and in Eastern Europe and in the Balkan states. So this would be for me very, very, very interesting. So my question is basically, where do you put your research? Thanks. So, uh, thanks for the question. That's the kind of question that makes me anxious. <laughs> um, it's something that I'm thinking very hard now. So um, uh, where I started from is from this very uh, HBS history and philosophy of science meets memory studies, right? So I have this framework from the project I'm working in, which is like a post-imperial uh, memory studies project looking at uh, in my case, post-imperial figures. And already here, Tesla is a really complicated person, right? Because he's not a politician. He's not a member of the ruling elite. Uh, he is an inventor. Uh, so it's already very, very uh, interesting, but also an odd, odd man here, how to track him in this perspective. Um, the memory studies part is, I think, fascinating. And this is where I'm taking the most inspiration from, because what I would like to produce is this uh, uh, um, overview or, or bird's eye view narrative of like overlapping commemorations and forgetting and how they actually slot into each other, how certain parts are strategically forgotten and other parts are strategically emphasized and they mix and match together and produce a really inconsistent mess, right? Uh, and this mess is produced because so many people claim him. So this is where I'm coming from largely. Um, this is how I'm trying to fit it. I can, I can give you some names who I'm reading now, but like topically, this is what it is. The immigration angle is something that I started thinking very early. And I would actually, uh, if we could meet for coffee uh, in Rijeka when I'm there, I would love to talk to you about this um, to, for you to give me uh, references and just to give me your ideas, where would you fit it and, and how does it go? Because I think this is this could be one of the central kind of uh, glues that connects it all, right? Um, so I'm very happy that you mentioned it and let's keep in touch, right? Uh, so we can talk about it, yeah. Great, um, I'm sorry, I'm speaking a lot today, but <laughs> still it's um, maybe my role to, uh, quickly uh, point people to the two questions that are in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I don't need to read them uh, extensively, but just have people uh, just a moment to, to go through over them. One was from Jeremy and one mm -hmm. was from Kevin Kenyard. I think mm -hmm. 
colleagues of yours at the Random Project. Indeed. And, uh, so maybe um, we can address uh, their queries and then wrap up on, around those. Uh, so the first one from Jeremy uh, was uh, looking at the role of Tesla in complicating the dichotomy between science and magic and religion. Um, that seems a very interesting angle to bring to the table. Yeah, it's this and is my good boss smuggling a topic we were talking about in the last couple of days as I was preparing for this lecture, but I had no time to include it. So he's very kind in asking it here. <laughs> uh, this is uh, right. This is a very big topic, right? Because if, if we think about uh, a science figure like Tesla mythologically, it involves rights. It, 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 it involves this kind of magical thinking about him. And actually this dichotomy between science and magic in history of science proper in the past decades, it's really completely destabilized. Like this whole narrative of enlightenment of the scientific revolution, industrial revolution, like of Weberian dis disenchantment of the world. All this is really on shaky ground because many historians, especially of the early modern period, make arguments that magic was uh, a part and parcel of natural philosophy, which we take as a predecessor of science, right? And magical thinking and uh, organized magic traditions were actually knowledge produ production traditions. So it was a type of knowledge that had a function that was valuable, that was a description of the world, that wasn't occultist or, uh, or, or uh, 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 epistemically bad, uh, uh, subjective or something like that, but a crucial part of this. And um, thinking about Tesla very, in a much later period, so from the 19th century and the 20th century, um, there could be an argument to be made that this mythological figure needs to be a scientist, right? Uh, because he is involved in the elites that produce the world pictures, right? So he is the wizard. It's not by chance that the tabloids at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century call him the wizard and Edison the wizard, the magician. Edison is called the alchemist, right? So it's, it's a really uh, particular place in a public imagination that serves a social function. And this could uh, prove to be like a, a, a staging ground for thinking of um, science, popular science figures as the uh, mythology of the 20th century in a way, right? Um, so this is something that I'm keeping in the back of my head. It is so strong a view and such a large uh, analytical framework. That's something that I'm gonna, I, I'm hoping to address at the end of the project, but that's maybe a direction to go to, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Kevin had a question about Imervar um, and the Hidden Empire. Yeah, Imervar mostly focuses on um, World War II and slightly on World War I, right? Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's analytically complicated. Is it a hidden empire? Because there are some actors within this political system who have imperial amb ambitions and articulate them as that. And the empirical fact of the matter is that, uh, in, especially in Southeast Asia, it is a colonial power. So the United States is like, uh, especially what uh, in the Philippines, Puerto Rico, uh, um, Kevin mentioned it here. So it's a very contested category. And there's criticisms of saying that this is a hidden empire. My inspiration for it actually wasn't originally Imerwar, but um, the, oh, I lost her name now. Okay, I'm gonna remember it by the end of the talk. She's a, Audra Wolf, I think. Uh, Audra Wolf, I think. She's a historian of science writing diplomatic history of science. And she looks at American techno science as a part of um, American cultural diplomacy and as a cultural export. So this idea of the Republic of Science, this idea of objectivity, of uh, 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 value neutrality in the 20th century, this was really politically weaponized in, uh, especially during the Cold War, to export a certain worldview. So you had, Ma uh, you could say you had M McDonald's and science, right? I'm, I'm really bastardizing it here, but it's part of this kind of a view 
of science as a type of a cultural expert and the US being a reference culture for science too, not only for scientists, but for society at large. Um, so this is where I'm going with this hidden empire view of Tesla as the American, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, it might be right. I might lose Imervar as an inspiration by the end because it's too contested in the way that he puts it. I might have to kind of, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens, yeah. Well, I guess there's part of the scientific that plays into this hiding game, I guess. Yeah, yeah no, this, I mean, this is a very difficult topic to discuss, especially nowadays in post-Trumpian, uh, post post-truth uh, America, right? Uh, because these kind of critical historical studies always run the risk of rehashing the science wars of the 90s, like this, this big discussion of what is objectivity of science and can we be constructivist while looking at science and still keep the privileged position of, uh, of science as an epistemic practice? And do we want that? Like, do we, what does it mean to criticize science in this way? Uh, so I'm definitely a historian of science and I definitely do firmly believe there is a crucial contribution in Tesla's work and it played a crucial role in how uh, techno science developed and it, it was a service to humanity. So I think it's ultimately valuable and I'm not kind of um, trying to kind of uh, um, be constructivist about the contributions, right? Um, I think there is something valuable in it and I hope in my work that's gonna be salvaged or visible, yeah. yeah. We have one more uh, question or uh, feedback from Christian, and then. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to, to Ivan for your very uh, original and excellent uh, presentation about uh, Tesla. Uh, just, uh, um, let's say, a, a short question. I mean, uh, we, we know that um, the, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, Tesla was uh, depicted on the two euro coins and one euro coin in, in Croatia now. And, uh, but we also know that uh, in, in Serbia, the 100 dinara banknote has uh, Nikola Tesla. So uh, how do you, um, uh, what is your perception or uh, in your research? I mean, uh, this uh, uh, way of appropriation of uh, Nikola Tesla in, uh, in uh, both Serbia and, uh, and Croatia and uh, uh, how they make uh, rationalize is uh, um, to, to make uh, uh, Tesla Croat or a Serb. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there is maybe, the, it has been some shift uh, in this uh, perception uh, before, during uh, socialist Yugoslavia and after uh, socialist Yugoslavia with the breakup of Yugoslavia. If there is a, a difference or, or maybe not. Thank you very uh... much. I definitely think there's a huge difference uh, on the political situation and the kind of opportunities that are seized through commemorating Tesla, right? So in Yugoslavia, he was also a complicated figure, right? Because um, he went to American capitalism and gave birth to electric modernity, right? So he is, for communists, uh, a complicated figure. Uh, should he be celebrated and how are we gonna celebrate him? I'm still, I have to get into the sources here. I'm still um, in my analytical frameworks period, but I'm, I'm hoping to look into this, especially in these state funded commemorations of his centennials, right? Uh, because uh, uh, Yugoslav communists did them and part of his status in all, all uh, the successor state of, of, of communist Yugoslavia is the production, cultural production of uh, the state in communist Yugoslavia. So he was commemorated officially, he was included in curricula, he was celebrated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's very good to think about the Eurocoin thing, comparing uh, the opening of the center in Smiljan and the Eurocoin, because you have completely opposite moments there, where in, when Smiljan was opened, the Croatian and the Serbian government cooperated to open the center for commemorating the place of his birth and having a museum there, et cetera. So it was a kind of a act of friendship. This person unites us, right? This person is a Serb who uh, was born and lived in what is today Croatia at the time where the Serb question in Croatian, in, in politics in also Hungary among the, the Croatian elites was already happening. Uh, Tesla's family was involved in that, right? Uh, the the 
um, lettered priests and officers and, and a high position priests in his family or in the Orthodox Church, they were participating in the historical developments that would lead later on to conflict, right? So multiple conflicts, right? So um, he is not a simple figure there, but depending what is the political opportunity currently, the political elites instrumentalize it in different ways, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, that's that's the way that I look at it. I personally don't think there's anything bad with commemorating Tesla. I'm much happier that we're commemor. If if Tesla were a woman, I would be totally happy with it, <laughs> right? But uh, like commemorating an inventor and a scientist and this very kind of a productive, constructive, positive person with a with a wild imagination, it's something to be admired, and I think. It's really a happy moment where, when anybody commemorates him. But we always have to keep in mind that this is done for particular political purposes. And this is instrumentalized and contextualized in different ways, depending on the motivations of people. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think we are uh, heading towards uh, the conclusions and the goodbyes. I would like to again uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ivan Fliss, for this uh, this time uh, you spent with us, sharing uh, the contours of the research. Uh, we really hope we will be able to check in in the coming years and periods and uh, stay abreast of the of the how this will develop. Uh, unless Sanya, would you like to uh, say any institutional goodbye? Otherwise, I would just uh, wish everyone a good. No, I'm, I'm just always very happy to see uh, what the collegial uh, ambience in the uh, center creates. Uh, uh, mm, I don't know if any of you remember Piro Rejepi. Uh, who was also part of uh, Jeremy's project while he was in Germany. Peter just published a book uh, and I received uh, an invitation to review it. But then uh, at the same thing, I thought of a uh, wonderful thing that maybe we can all invite Peter to present his book online. He's now in uh, New Hampshire, so he's not in Europe, but nevertheless. So th that's that's how things go. It's like uh, always keep uh, keep in touch and uh, support each other in our endeavors. Thank you. Thanks. Great. So have a good day, everyone. And we'll see you next week, I think, for the fellows. Uh, and goodbye, Ivan. Be in touch when you're really a cat, definitely. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much for being here and for the questions. It was lovely. Thanks. Bye bye.